<clears throat> Thank you very much. And like Alan, I'm delighted to be here in Senate House, this wonderful Art Deco building. And of course, it's where George Orwell based his uh, novel 1984. And this building was the Ministry of Truth. <laughs> Let us see. Um, thanks for coming, everyone, today. And uh, thanks to all those that organized today's event, because uh, political events don't happen by accident. The Labour Party didn't happen by accident. We're a massive, essentially voluntary organization trying to change the lives of everyone in this country for the better. That's what the Labour Party is about. And I thank you all for coming today and for your work within the party. The people of this country are going to face an historic decision on the 23rd of June, whether to remain part of the European Union or to leave. I welcome the fact that that decision is now in the hands of the people. Indeed, I voted to support a referendum during the last Parliament. The move to hold this referendum may have been more about managing divisions in the Conservative Party, but it's now a crucial democratic opportunity for people to have their say on our country's future and the future of our continent as a whole. As Alan explained, the Labour Party is overwhelmingly for staying in because we believe the European Union has brought investment, jobs and protection for workers, consumers and the environment and offers the best chance of meeting the challenges we face in the 21st century. Labour is convinced that a vote to remain in is in the best interests of the people of this country. In the coming century, we face absolutely huge challenges as a people, as a continent, and as a global community. How to deal with climate change. How to address the overweening power of global corporations and ensure they pay fair taxes. How to tackle cybercrime and terrorism. How to ensure we trade fairly and protect jobs and pay in an era of globalization. How to address the causes of the huge refugee movements across the world. There are now more people than at any time in recorded history who are refugees or asylum seekers or displaced people across the planet. And how we adapt to a world where people everywhere move more frequently to live, work and retire. All of these issues are serious and pressing and self-evidently require international cooperation. Collective international action through the European Union is clearly going to help meeting these vital challenges. Britain will be stronger if we cooperate with our neighbours in facing those challenges together. Portugal's new socialist prime minister and a good friend, Antonio Costa, said this. In the face of all these crises around the world, we must not divide Europe, we must strengthen it. When the last referendum was held in 1975, Europe was divided by the Cold War. And what later became the EU was much smaller, purely market-driven arrangement. Over the years... I and many others have been very critical of many decisions taken by the EU. And I remain very critical of its shortcomings, from its lack of democratic accountability to the institutional pressures to deregulate or privatise public services. So, Europe needs to change. But that change can only come from working with our allies in the European Union to achieve it. It's perfectly possible to be critical and still be convinced we need to remain a member. I've had a few differences with the direction the Labour Party has taken over the past few years, as some people may have noticed. <laughs> but I've been sure that it was right to stay as a member of the party. I joined the Labour Party when I was 16, and I'm very proud of that. Some might say I've even managed to do something more recently, about changing the direction of the Labour Party. And I'm enjoying that as well. In contrast, four decades ago, the EU of today brings together most of the countries in Europe and has developed important employment, environmental and consumer protections. I've listened very closely to the views of trade unions, environmental groups, human rights organisations and, of course, to Labour Party members and supporters and fellow members of Parliament. They are overwhelmingly convinced 
that we can best make a positive difference by remaining in Europe. Britain needs to stay in the EU as the best framework for trade, manufacturing and cooperation in the 21st century. Tens of billions of pounds worth of investment and millions of jobs are linked to our relationship with the EU, the biggest market in the world. EU membership has guaranteed working people vital employment rights, including four weeks paid holiday, maternity and paternity leave, protection for agency workers, health and safety in the workplace. Being in the EU has raised our environmental standards, from beaches to air quality, and protected consumers from rip-off charges. But we also need to make the case for reform in Europe. The reform David Cameron's government has no interest in, but plenty of others across Europe do. That means democratic reform, to make the EU more accountable to its people. Economic reform, to end self-defeating austerity and put jobs and sustainable growth at the centre of European policy. <clears throat> Labour market reform to strengthen and extend workers' rights in a real social Europe. And new rights for governments and elected authorities to support public enterprise and halt the pressure to privatise services. So the case I'm making for remain and reform in Europe. Today is Global Day of Action for Fast Food Workers' Rights. In the US, workers are demanding $15 an hour. In the UK, £10 now. Labour is an internationalist party and socialists have understood from the earliest days of the Labour movement that workers need to make common cause across national borders. Working together in Europe has led to significant gains for workers in Britain and we are determined to deliver further progressive reform. The democratic Europe of social justice and workers' rights that people throughout our continent want to see. Real reform will, make, will mean making Progressive alliances across Europe, something the Conservatives will never do and probably don't understand. Take, for example, the crisis in the steel industry. Yes, it's a global problem and a challenge to many European governments. So why is it that only the British government has failed so comprehensively to act to save steel production at home? The European Commission proposed new tariffs on Chinese steel but it was the British government that blocked those coordinated efforts to stop Chinese steel dumping. Those proposals are still on the table. So today, now, I ask David Cameron and George Osborne to start sticking up for steel in this country and work with our willing European partners to secure the future of this absolutely vital industry. It's in their hands. There are certainly problems about EU state aid rules which need reform. But if, as the Leave side argues, it is the EU that is the main problem, then how is it that Germany, Italy, France and Spain have all done much better at protecting their steel industries than the British government? Again, I say to David Cameron and George Osborne, act now to defend and support our steel industry. It is because... Those other countries have acted within EU state aid rules to support their industries, whether through taking a public stake, investing in research and development, providing loan guarantees, or compensating for energy costs. It's not the EU that is the problem, but the Conservative government here in Britain that doesn't recognise the strategic importance of our steel industry. For our <laughs> important for our economy, and for the jobs and skills of those communities, those communities that are now going through such tension and such pressure as they're fearful of the future of their jobs and all of the local community that goes with them. The Conservative government has blocked action on Chinese steel dumping. It has cut investment in infrastructure that would have created demand for more steel and had no procurement strategy to support our steel industry. A Labour government would have worked very differently with partners across Europe to stand up 
for steel production in this country. That is what a Labour government would do so differently to what this government is doing. The European Union has 28 countries and 520 million people. Could have made us stronger by defending our steel industries together. The actions of the Conservative government have weakened us. The jobs being created by this government are too often low skill, low pay and insecure. If we harness Europe's potential, we could be doing far more to defend high-skilled jobs in the steel industry, and that goes for other employers of high-skilled staff too. Airbus, Nissan, they've made it clear that their choice to invest in Britain is strengthened by the membership of the European Union. Of course, the Conservatives are loyally committed to protecting one very, very important British industry and you have to take your hat off to them for the massive defence they're making of this industry and that is the tax avoidance industry. <laughs> <clears throat> the most telling revelation about our Prime Minister has not been about his own tax affairs but that in 2013, he personally intervened with the European Commission president to undermine an EU drive to reveal the beneficiaries of offshore trusts. And even now, in the wake of the Panama Papers, he still won't act, as Prime Minister's Question Time revealed yesterday. And on six different occasions since the beginning of last year, Conservative members of the European Parliament have voted down attempts to take action against tax dodging. Doesn't that tell you everything you need to know about the Conservative Party? Labour has allies across Europe prepared to take on this global network of the corrupt and we will work with them to clamp down on those determined to suck wealth out of our economies and the pockets of our people. On Tuesday, the EU announced a step forward on country by country reporting. We believe we can go further, but even this modest measure, and it is a very modest measure, was opposed by Conservative MEPs last December. Left to themselves, it is clear that the main vote leave vision is for Britain to be the safe haven of choice for the ill-gotten gains of every dodgy oligarch dictator or rogue corporation. They believe this tiny global elite is what matters not the rest of us, who they dismiss as, sadly, and it's probably everybody in this room, low achievers, I'm sorry. <laughs> Some argue that we need to leave the EU because the single market's rules are driving deregulation and privatisation. They certainly need reform. But it's not the EU that privatised our railways. It was a Conservative government of John Major. And many of our rail routes are now run by other nations, publicly owned rail companies. So they're publicly owned, but not by our public. They haven't made the mistake of asset stripping their own countries. Labour is committed to bringing rail back into public ownership in 2020. And that's why Labour members of the European Parliament are opposing any element of the fourth rail package currently being discussed before the European Parliament that might make that more difficult. We are very clear, we want the railways back in public hands to be run for the benefit of the people of this country. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership also is a huge cause for concern. But we defeated a similar proposal before in Europe together when it was called a multilateral agreement on investment. That was back in 1998. Labour MPs are rightly opposing the investor state dispute mechanism, opposing any attempt to enforce privatisation of our public services, to reduce com consumer rights, workplace protections or environmental standards. We will not be part of a race to the bottom. We want a race to go up, not down, on the living standards and environmental standards of everybody across the whole continent. <clears throat> the the free market enthusiasts in the Leave campaign would put all those protections at risk. Labour is building alliances to safeguard them. We must also put human rights at the centre of our trade agreements, absolutely at the centre of them, not as an optional add-on. We already have allies across Europe to do that. And, it, and the EU is vital 
for promoting human rights at home. As a result of EU directives and regulations, disabled people are protected from discrimination. Lifts, cars and buses need and must be accessible, as does sea and air travel. It was the Labour government that signed the Human Rights Act into UK law, that transferred power from government, not to Brussels, but to individual citizens to stand up for and defend their human rights. Human rights are global, universal, and have to be defended for all time. They're the rights that we've achieved for ourselves. Climate change is the greatest threat that humanity faces this century. And no country, Britain certainly not, cannot tackle it alone. We could have the best policies possible, but unless we act together internationally, it is worthless. It was a Labour government that brought in the Climate Change Act. John Prescott played a key role in getting the Kyoto Protocols that led the debate within the European Union. But despite David Cameron pledging, do you remember those days, to lead the greenest government ever? <laughs> That was the Hugger Husky period. <clears throat> Britain still lags far behind most of Europe in terms of renewable energy production. We have much to learn from what Germany has done in particular. The Conservative government has cut subsidies for solar power while increasing subsidies for diesel. It has cut regulatory burdens, as they describe them, on fracking, yet increased regulations on onshore wind production. They say one thing, but do another. Again, it's been regulations agreed in Europe that have improved Britain's beaches and waterways and that are forcing us to tackle the scandal of air pollution all over this country, including in this very city of London, which will, if not dealt with, kill 500,000 people in this country by 2025. We have to act on air pollution by enforcing those regulations. Working together in Europe is vital to tackle climate change and vital in protecting the environment that we all share. The point about the environmental issues is quite simply this. If you pollute the air, the wind takes it across a national border. If you throw rubbish into the sea, a current will bring it to somebody else's border. You only clean up the air and clean up the seas by international regulation and cooperation. You can't do it on your own. <clears throat> there is... No doubt, debate about the EU membership in the next couple of months will focus strongly on jobs and on migration. We live in an increasingly globalised world. Many of us will study, work or even retire abroad at some point in our lives. Free movement has created opportunities for people, British people and others. There are nearly three quarters of a million British people living in Spain and over two million living in other parts of Europe. Learning abroad, working abroad, increases opportunities and skills, and migration brings benefits as well as challenges at home. But it's only if there is government action to train enough skilled workers to stop the exploitation of migrant labour by undercutting wages, to invest in local services and housing in areas of rapid population growth, that they will be felt across the whole country. And this government has done nothing of the sort. Its failure to train enough skilled workers means we've become reliant on migration to keep our economy functioning. This is especially true of the National Health Service, which depends on migrant nurses and doctors to fill vacancy. This government has failed to invest in training and its abolition of nurses' bursaries and its decision to pick a fight with the brilliant junior doctors is likely to make these shortages worse, not better. <clears throat> As Alan explained in his introduction, that both of us are trade unionists, and I used to be a full-time trade union organiser within the National Health Service as well as local government. And I value our NHS, absolutely, and I admire the dedication of all its staff. 
It is Labour's proudest creation. But right now, it would be an even, in an even greater crisis if many on the Leave side had had their way, some of whom have argued against the National Health Service and the very principle of health care free at the point of use for everybody. And, of course, it's, an e it's EU regulations that underpin many rights at work. Holiday entitlement, maternity leave, rights to take breaks, and limits on how many hours we can work. And that has helped to improve protection for agency workers. The Tories and UKIP are on record of saying they would like to cut back on EU guaranteed, guaranteed workplace rights if they could. A Labour government would instead strengthen rights at work, making common cause with our allies to raise employment standards throughout Europe, to stop the undercutting of wages and conditions by unscrupulous employers who want to achieve greater exploitation. We want to strengthen the protection of every worker all over Europe, not just in Britain. <laughs> just, just imagine what the Tories would do to workers' rights here in Britain if we voted to leave the EU in June. They would dump rights on equal pay, working time, annual leave, agency workers, maternity pay, as fast as they could get away with it. It would be a bonfire of rights that Labour governments have secured and trade unions have helped to secure across the whole of this continent. Not only that, it wouldn't be a Labour government negotiating, sadly, a better settlement for working people than the EU. It would be a Tory government, quite possibly led by Boris Johnson and backed by Nigel Farage. <laughs> Think about that. That would negotiate the worst of all worlds, a free market free for all, shorn of rights and protections for people all across this continent. It's sometimes easier to blame the EU, or worse, blame foreigners, than face up to our own problems, at the head of which right now is a Conservative government that's failing the people of Britain. There is nothing remotely patriotic about selling off our country and our national assets to the highest bidder, or handing control of our economy to city hedge funds and tax-dodging corporations based in offshore tax havens. There is a strong socialist case for saying in the European Union, just as there's also a powerful socialist case for reform and progressive change in Europe. That's why we need a Labour government to stand up at the European level for industries and communities in Britain, to back public ownership and public services, to protect and extend workers' rights, and to work with our allies to make both Britain and Europe work better for working people. Many people are still weighing up how they're going to vote in this referendum. And I appeal to everyone, especially young people, who will live the longest with the, and have to bear the consequences for the longest, to make sure you're registered to vote and, keep, and vote to keep Britain in Europe this June. This is about your future. By working together across our continent, we can develop our economies, protect social and human rights, tackle climate change and clamp down on tax dodgers. You cannot build a better world unless you engage with the world, build allies and deliver change. The European Union, many warts and all, has proved itself to be a crucial international framework to do that. That's why we're backing the Britain Remain in Europe campaign, and I hope you will too. Thank you very much. So we're expecting a couple of questions to come now to Mr Corbyn from journalists, so we'll just stay with this for a second or two. We've got some time for some questions, first of all from the media, then from some members, Laura Koonsberg from BBC. Um, thank you very much. Um, Mr Corbyn, in the, let's go for the Ministry of Truth, as we are here in the Senate House. Um, You've voted against the EU many times. Before today, you've branded some of its policies crazy and immoral. 
Would you now actually describe yourself as a pro-European? And also, you've barely mentioned one of the things that really matters to many of our viewers about the EU, which is the number of people coming from other countries in the EU to this country. Do you think too many people from other parts of the EU have come to live and work in the UK? No, I don't think too many have come. I think that uh, the issue has to be of wages and regulations, which I included in my speech. And it's employers that uh, try to undercut industry-wide agreements in the construction industry and others that are the problem. Hence the uh, agency workers issue that I raised in my speech, as well as minimum wages that I raised in my speech. There has to be a case for a minimum wage tied to the cost of living all across the continent. There is nothing wrong with people migrating to work around the continent, but there has to be a level playing field on pay and conditions. What we have is unscrupulous employers doing that. Yes, I've been critical of many um, things within the European Union. I think you would have probably gathered from my speech I have many criticisms of the European Union. This is a decision about whether we stay in and argue for the kind of socially just Europe that I want, that our party wants, that the vast majority of trade unions and ordinary people in this country want, or we walk away from it. That's the, that's the decision that's been made. Does it mean I recant on everything I've ever said or done? Absolutely not. I'm sorry about that. <laughs>